Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is concepts lecture number 28, the last concepts lecture on the question, should you learn art theories? I'm going to give some pros and cons about learning art theory mainly, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about art history. I promised this lecture at the beginning and where it was also a kind of a halfway point questioning lecture, concepts lecture 14, I think. But this is the one where I've collected all the most skeptical questions. First, though, I want to give an overview of the theories that we've been looking at. So down at the bottom there, I have it down at the bottom because it'll fit the next couple slides. And down at the bottom are the theories used in art history at the beginning of the 20th century. So from lecture five, style analysis is a way of describing and identifying art historical styles. Formal analysis is a way of making an inventory of the visible properties of an artwork. Connoisseurship means the appreciation and evaluation of works of art, often non-verbally. So this is what you would have learned in art history classes back in 1910 to 1920 or so. And I placed these at the beginning of the concepts lectures, partly for that reason, that they're kind of foundational The next steps in the growth of art theory were the addition of iconography, meaning the study of signs and stories in figural art. I mentioned that among other places in lecture 10 on relation, in relation to Giotto's painting of infidelity that you see there. And the principal art historian in that field is um, Ervin Panofsky. So this is what you would have learned in art history classes from maybe 1940 to about 1970. So now I'm building a tree of theories this next half generation, next generation after uh, the style analysis, connoisseurship and formal analysis, there was Panofsky and iconography. In the 1970s, more methods were added. Social art history, which is the study of the relation between art and its social and political setting. Feminisms, psychoanalysis and semiotics. Uh, and these are all still common in art history classes today. So. This is kind of like a branching tree model and all of those in no particular order up at the top. After around 2000 or so, many more theories were adopted in art history and criticism. Um, and most of these are mentioned in other lectures, but this list could be expanded to 30 or more and it's still growing. So there's affect theory, object-oriented ontology, thing theory, decolonial theory, border studies, migratory aesthetics, neuroaesthetics, performativity theory. I actually mentioned all of these in other lectures except neuroaesthetics. So here's a summary of the growth of theories. An artist who wants to be informed about contemporary art has many more theories to learn and to choose from than just a generation ago. If you study art history or art theory, Learning concepts can end up to be a full-time job and no one really masters it. On the right there, that's a list of theorists that have been cited in the journal Critical Inquiry, which is a major uh, cultural theory journal. And I've underlined the ones that are mentioned in these lectures. So a pretty good survey of the theories that were represented in that journal. As an artist, you may only need like one or two of these. And of course the problem is to determine which ones. So first, some pros and cons of learning art theory, and then I'll talk about art history. In favor of learning theories, depending on where you go after art school, you may not need any art theories. There's a couple reasons, though, to think about learning theories. First of all, you can use theories to understand your own work. Um, any of the concepts that I've talked about that have some point of intersection that might be useful to your work can also be helpful for you to interpret and understand your, your own work. They can help to articulate ideas uh, that might not have been entirely um, clear. They might have been more like feelings or intuitions. You can also use theories to understand what people tell you about your work in critiques. So I, I run, for example, a class uh, which analyzes critiques uh, and one of the things we spend our time doing is uh, figuring out which theories instructors are using because instructors are often influenced by different theories of art, even if they're not actually reading the theories, but some of these theories are just in the air. And, and if you know the theories, you can recognize them. 
Um, and of course, if your instructors are actually mentioning some of these people, then you can go and uh, look them up. And if you study them, then you can have a much better idea of what people are telling you. And later, after you graduate, if you go on in the art world, then you're also going to be hearing these things in galleries and even in reviews of your work. So this is in favor of learning theories that they can help you to understand what people are telling you about your work. You can also use theories for your career. Uh, lots of artists put references to theories in their artist statements. Many of the names of theorists that I've mentioned in these lectures will turn up in uh, artist statements. And at the MFA level, there's a lot of effort uh, sometimes um, put into the crafting of artist statements and the ways that they uh, mention whatever theories uh, are informing the work. And you could also use them, of course, for art, for talks, the gallery talks, and for conversations with curators and collectors and so on. So there's a kind of a use value to theories in terms of your career. One of the, I think, best reasons to argue in favor of learning theories is that artists who don't learn theories or only learn them halfway can sometimes be insecure about their work. So if your work is feminist in some sense, but you don't know the relevant feminism, you may not be sure about saying or doing certain things. Um, and that uncertainty can show up in your work. This is actually a really common phenomenon where um, people didn't, people, artists didn't really learn the theories that their own work uh, addresses. And so they're not really confident about making the right steps in their work. They think they might be repeating things or getting things wrong. And the result is that the work itself becomes a little bit uh, timid. Um, and so the work suffers because um, there's not the confidence of that you get by reading the theory. There are also plenty of arguments against learning theories. So here are some good reasons not to study theories ever again after these lectures. First of all, they can keep you from your work. Studying some theories takes a long time. It might take even a couple of years of reading to be confident about someone like Lacan or Derrida, or someone like that, or even just to study a concept like affect. It might take a couple of years until you're really um, sure of it. So studying theories can definitely distract you from your work. It can even um, paralyze or suspend your interest in your work. Some people go, go down the theory rabbit hole but that definitely studying theories takes a long time. So they take you, it take you, takes you out of the, the studio and puts you in the library, so to speak. Also, theories can lead you to produce poor work because there is a kind of artwork that just illustrates theories or it needs theories to support it. That kind of artwork can be successful, but often isn't in the art world because um, art critics and uh, historians and curators and galleries can recognize it. Um, so theories can actually um, produce bad work if, the, if, you, um, if you're tempted to just illustrate a theory um, or, or um, embody a theory with your artwork, uh, then that can be perceived as, um, as not a good thing to do, making bad work. Theories can also deceive you about the nature of your own work by making you think you understand it. This may seem a little... Um, strange, but it's actually really common, especially at the upper level, BFA and MFA level, where some artists come to believe that their work is informed by certain theories, but the instructors don't see it that way. So in, for example, MFA critiques, sometimes the students will give set speeches about the theories that they're trying to develop in their work, and the instructors will scratch their heads and say, well, actually, um, in so many words, I think you might have deceived yourself about your own work. You're hiding from what's really going on in the work um, and you're hiding behind a theory. And if you would stop reading and thinking and talking about this theory, then maybe it would be possible to see what's really going on in your work. So this is actually pretty common. Theories can help you not to think about something that's really troublesome about your work because a theory can be something that you're really happy to master and happy to talk about it, and, and it presents a good face and all the rest of that, um, but can actually be a kind of a smoke screen or even a brick wall between yourself um, and part of your work. There are also pros and cons to studying art history. Uh, I teach art history and I teach a section of our global world art history survey 
um, and I have a whole series of history lectures that go along with these, uh, but there are pros and cons to it. It's not necessarily an obvious thing that it's good for every artist to have some art history and art history survey or other art history courses. So there are good reasons to study art history, first of all. If you study art history, you will see how other people's works lead up to yours. You'll see where you are in history and what styles, what practices, and so on uh, your work descends from. And that can help give you ideas about where to go next. And it can refine your judgments about past artists. And it can help you to calibrate your practice in relation to other artists so history has the function of providing the setting um, to a practice which you might have thought was more isolated than maybe it was. At the same time, you put yourself in an imaginary conversation with other artists, so be part of a community. And of course, with living artists, an actual conversation. And that could be very good for your art because viewers will be able to see how you've thought about and responded to similar artists. Sometimes uh, in art school critiques, the instructors will say things like, well, have you seen so-and-so? Uh, you should look at so-and-so, the art, the art of so-and-so. And that kind of comment uh, won't happen if, it's, if your art makes it clear that you have seen those other artists, you've thought about them, and you've decided what you're going to do differently or how you're going to respond or how you're going to answer them. Um, so the more art history you know, the richer your art becomes because it enters into an imaginary conversation, which becomes a visible conversation with artists of the past. Uh, those echoes and references to other artists can enrich your own artwork. But there are reasons not to learn art history, even to avoid art history. So first of all, you may become anxious about other artists and that may show up in your work. Uh, that's, this is also a pretty common thing because if, if you think you think of like a, a, an old master painter, they were often anxious about the supposed genius of, of Michelangelo or Raphael or someone like that. That kind of thing can be paralyzing. It doesn't have to be someone who's far back in history. It can be somebody who's contemporary. You can, you can look at a contemporary artist's work and say, oh my God, you know, I will, I'll never be able to do anything like that. But especially when you start studying art history, you'll see that there are many, many artists that could produce this kind of anxiety in you. And, you, and this can be really paralyzing. And so in general, this is true that learning history for an artist is a dangerous thing uh, because uh, not every influence is a good influence. Not every um, artist can help you or inspire you uh, or energize you to make your own work. Sometimes they can actually stop you from making your own work. And if you just feel anxious, but you are going ahead and making artwork anyway, even though some, some artist you admire has done it better or first, or something like that, then the, your anxiety can show up in your work. People will maybe see your work as being anxious, um, as opposed to as being ambitious or interested in the previous work. You may also end up making pastiches, that is weak versions of work that other artists have done. In the 20th century, the big example of this is Picasso. The 20th century is absolutely full of painters all around the world who were looked up to Picasso or deeply influenced by Picasso, and they absolutely were not capable of carrying Picasso's work forward or answering it in an interesting way, and they ended up making often very uninteresting versions of Picasso's. You won't see these in major museums, but of course you could find them on the internet, and you could find them in small museums and in art galleries all around the world. There must be hundreds of thousands of pastiches of Picasso's in the 20th century. So one of the reasons, or another reason, for not to learn art history is to not fall into this trap that so many artists uh, fall into of, of being incapable of responding in an interesting or powerful or convincing or compelling way to some artist uh, who uh, you think is a good artist. The last of these is the most uh, subtle it's one that I develop in the history lectures as well. If you study too much art history, you may end up feeling less strongly about some art or maybe even about all art because art history teaches you to appreciate and to appreciate in, a, in, a, in an equal way and maybe even a neutral way, the art of all periods. 
that's the that's the feeling behind a lot of these uh, art history survey texts. You can appreciate the entire world, but making art requires you to commit to a position or a practice and to form judgments about art, other artists, to decide what you like and what you don't like. And that kind of uh, judgment is fundamentally not art historical. So the longer you study art history, and the, many, the more different art history courses you take about the more different cultures that you, that you, that you study, the less capable you might be of forming judgments and deciding what you like and dislike. Art history creates a kind of um, generalized um, appreciation of all different cultures and periods, which makes it, which can make it fundamentally impossible to create a strong position for yourself. So a bit about my own position. I take these questions about art history and theory really seriously. I think there are many reasons to mistrust and avoid art history and theory. Uh, one of the reasons I put together these lectures is just so that um, you can think about whether or not you want to go on in art history or art theory. Uh, now that you have a fair amount of information about both of them at the end of the first year, you can make this decision for yourself. I think there are a lot of reasons to mistrust and avoid art history and theory. I don't think it's automatically good for art students to learn either art history or theory. Um, ex so except for the introductory lecture, I've kept my own books out of these lectures, um, but there is a chapter in this book, Pictures and Tears, um, that explains how art history can become a poison. It's about the way that I, I lost the capacity to really respond to a painting that I used to really love. This book uh, is about people who have cried in front of paintings. So it's about uh, the history of people who had really, really strong emotional reactions in front of paintings. Um, and I have a chapter in this book in which I describe the painting, which um, I don't think I ever cried in front of this painting, but, I, but it was the painting that gave me the strongest reactions and how reading and studying art history ruined that. So here's that example to end up. This is the painting. It's a Renaissance painting uh, by Giovanni Bellini. It's called The Ecstasy of St. Francis, and it shows the saint he's been studying in his uh, cellule, it's called, which is like a little cave, or he lived out in the so-called wilderness. It's, it's really just Italy, right? But it's supposed to be a wilderness. And then he comes outside and he has a revelation. Um, and this is a painting of him having his revelation. When I was just starting, I was originally a painter, not an art historian. I thought this painting was the best landscape painting ever made. I was absolutely amazed by it. I used to, when I visited New York City, just go straight to this and look at this painting. The kind of things I thought were great about it were like down at the very bottom uh, part, there are, these, there are these plants. Every leaf is different. Every stem goes in a slightly different direction. Every rock is different. Every tree is different. But then I started studying art history and I read about this painting and I discovered that it's a religious painting. It's about the stigmatization of St. Francis. He receives a revelation from that cloud in the upper left um, and he receives the wounds that Christ received when he was crucified. It's actually a religious painting. And I learned in art history that all my ideas about landscape that I thought were so amazing here were all anachronistic. In other words, I was projecting them back in time inappropriately. All my ideas that I had about this amazing landscape were all romantic. That is, came from the 19th century. They didn't exist for this painter. So I had a, a deeply mistaken idea about what this painting was. That kind of knowledge, that art historical knowledge, um, you can't forget it. And in that way, art history basically ruined this painting for me. And I still like this painting. I still go and see it when I have a chance but I don't really feel that much anymore because my feelings required me to not know about what art history teaches. So sometimes I think art history is not like um, a filing cabinet of knowledge or a buffet of different uh, flavors than from, the, from history. Sometimes it's a little bit more like a poison well. And the more you drink at it, the more sick you become or at least, I guess, better in this metaphor, the more neutral you become uh, because it takes away your ability to feel in the way that you had felt uh, and substitutes for that uh, the truths of art history. 
So that's my, that's my pessimistic story to end the entire concepts lecture series. Should you learn concepts and theories? And should you learn art history? I think if you're going to study the academic side of things, then the answer is very simple. Yes, you need to study them because they're the subject matter of art criticism, art history, and so on, art theory. If you're going to be an artist, these are not simple questions because art history is not simply necessarily bad or good and its utility and uh, can change through time depending on your practice. Hopefully now you have more concepts and theories you can decide for yourself. I'm very interested in reactions to these lectures and especially reactions to the first year experience. So if any of you have gotten to this point and you're hearing this toward the end of the year and you've had a long time to think about it and to think ahead and you've made a decision about what you might want to do at least for the next couple of years with theory and art history, please let me know. You can contact me through the School of the Art Institute and the email there uh, and maybe your stories will end up in future versions of these lectures. So good luck and that's it. I'm out of here.